Hi, I'm Mark Engelberg. This is Solving Problems Declaratively. Donald Knuth is the author of The Art of Computer Programming, an encyclopedia of knowledge about computer science and algorithms. Recently, Knuth gave a talk at Brown University, and at the end of the talk during the Q&A session, a student asked him, why do you use puzzles so much as examples in your book? And he explained that he really likes puzzles because the problem statements are simple and clear, but the problem solving process is complex enough that it gives you a feeling for how it applies to real world techniques. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce to you a puzzle that's gonna serve as a running example throughout this talk. It's called the Y covering problem, and it's based around this piece called the Y pentomino. It's called that because if you stand it up on its side and look at it and just the right way, it looks kind of like the letter Y, and it's a pentomino because it's made up of five squares. Now, a 10 by 10 grid has 100 squares, so that raises the question, can we take 20 of these Y pieces and flipping and rotating them any way we want, can we cover the 10 by 10 grid? And as you can see from this illustration, yes, it's possible. And so then the question is, how do you write a program to find this solution and to do things like counting how many solutions there are? We can extend the problem, make it a little more computationally difficult by asking if you can put 45 Y shapes on a 15 by 15 grid, and as you can see, that's possible as well. If we're gonna to try to write a program to solve this, we're gonna need some kind of data structure to represent a Y piece in, in a given placement on the grid. So I've chosen to represent Y as a set of row column coordinates, zero based from the upper left corner of the grid. So I've defined here the basic Y shape. The next step is to define all the symmetries. So I've given a demonstration of what the reflect across the main diagonal function would look like. Uh, using the same technique, we can put together all four rotational symmetries and the four reflection symmetries, and then we apply them all to the basic Y shape, and now we have all the eight forms of Y. And then we can write a function that's going to scan across the grid, left to right, top to bottom, and find all the possible ways that all these Y shapes can fit into this 10 by 10 grid. So I've demonstrated at the bottom what happens when you call this with the board size 10 for 10 by 10 grid, and it starts spitting out a lazy sequence of all the possible placements of Y. Now we're ready to actually solve the Y cover problem. The basic challenge is to find some combination of those placements that cover each space of the grid exactly once. So I'd like you to start thinking about how you would go about writing a program to solve that. But meanwhile, I'm going to show you another problem, and then I'm going to come back and show you how it connects with this one. The next problem I'd like to talk about is called the exact cover problem. You're given a matrix of zeros and ones, and your challenge is to find a subset of rows where among those rows you have exactly one one in every column. So for example, given this matrix of zeros and ones, we can choose these three rows and we get exactly one one in each column from those chosen rows. So this would be called a covering of this matrix. This particular matrix only has one covering, but conceivably a matrix could have many possible covers. If you want to solve that problem efficiently, the natural question to ask is what operations need to be really fast in order to solve that problem efficiently? Well, Knuth was one of the first people to write about this problem, and he observed that a couple of the things you can do with a doubly linked list turn out to be highly relevant to this problem. One of the things you can do with a doubly linked list, looking at node C, is it's really easy to delete that C from the list, uh, simply by rerouting a couple of pointers around it. So right now, C is kind of invisible when you're doing a left to right traversal, and it's invisible when you do a right to left traversal. But we leave behind these pointers pointing out from C. That's actually very intentional because that means C knows exactly where it belongs in this doubly linked list and it's really trivial to backtrack and splice it right back into the list. So using that as a model, 
Knuth came up with this really beautiful data structure in an algorithm that he called the dancing links algorithm. What he does is he takes this matrix and he turns it into this data structure that has a node for every one of the ones in that matrix. Every row is connected by a circular doubly linked list. Every column is connected by a circular doubly linked list. And there's a bunch of column headers at the top which keep track of a count of how many ones there are in the column. And those are also connected in these circular doubly linked lists as well. And then the algorithm, I'll show a couple steps here, basically involves rerouting these links around the other nodes to temporarily make them invisible and backtrack them very quickly. The, I'm not going to go into more detail than this. The main takeaway I want you to have from looking at this picture is that this algorithm to perform efficiently relies heavily on doubly linked lists, mutation, pointer manipulation. These are not closure's strong suits, which raises the question, how do you implement something like this in closure? I wanted to implement this algorithm in closure. I had a problem that would benefit from this, and I wanted to implement this. And I sat down and tried a bunch of different techniques. I tried using records. I tried using uh, atoms as my pointers. I tried a bunch of things. I was not getting the performance I was looking for. Then I discovered an amazing library that potentially speeds up your closure code tremendously, making your programs way, way faster. And surprisingly enough, this library actually comes bundled with closure. <laughs> so I began to embrace this idea that Java is essentially Clojure's assembly language. And I mean that in the sense that back when I used to do C programming, every once in a while I'd have some kind of highly performant thing I would need to do, and I'd drop down to the assembly level and kind of splice that into my code. And I've realized you can do the same kind of thing with Java and Clojure. So I took the dancing links algorithm and I implemented the core data structure and pointer manipulation, all that stuff at the Java level. And then I created an open source library called Tarantella. Tarantella exposes a single function in its API called dancing links. And it can take a matrix in a few different formats. And it handles the details of taking that matrix, depending on what format you give it, and turning it into a data structure that is relevant to the underlying Java library. And then it cranks through the, the Java dancing links algorithm on it. And then it takes the result, spits it back out in a closure form that you can use. Uh, today, I'm going to be using as examples these first two kinds of inputs. Uh, it can take a matrix of ones and zeros. And it can also take a map of the form that it goes from row labels to a set of all the column labels that have a one in it for that row. So here's an example of the dancing links function in action. I've passed to it a matrix of zeros and ones, the same one we saw in the previous example. And it spits out that there's only one solution, and it's the rows three, zero, and four. Now, I promised that I would connect this back up to the first problem. Hopefully, you've been thinking about how you would solve the Y cover problem. But now I'm going to show you what I think is a much cooler way to solve it than probably what you're thinking. We can actually use this dancing links algorithm to solve Y cover by turning it into an instance of the exact cover problem. What we have to do is we need to come up with a matrix of ones and zeros that represents the Y cover problem so we can feed it to dancing links and the result we get back is a solution to the Y cover problem. The key idea here is to make each row of the matrix, we label it with the placement, one of those Y placements. The columns are all the different cells of the grid. And then for every row, for every placement, we're going to go through and we're going to mark with a 1 all the cells that it occupies. So this first row, this placement is occupying 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and 1, 2. So I've marked with the 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and 1, 2. So we do that for every row. Now when we pump this into the dancing links algorithm, we're going to get back a combination of rows that 
has exactly one one in each of these columns. That's a combination of placements that occupies every cell of the grid exactly once, which is exactly what we need. That's a Y cover. Now, I mentioned that one of the input formats we can give to the dancing links function is a mapping from row labels to sets of column labels. Well, in this instance, if you take this row label and you map it to a set of the column labels with ones in it, that's the same as the original set. So in this case, building that particular matrix representation is incredibly convenient. It's as simple as just doing a zip map of all the placements with itself. We can pass it to the dancing links function. Uh, it takes optionally as a keyword limit one if you, or limit any number if you want to limit it to a certain number of solutions. So this will spit out one solution. And I wrote a little visualization function that visualizes this as a picture. That's the picture I showed you at the beginning of the talk. We can also count how many solutions there are. And what if we gained by solving the problem in this way? Well, first of all, it makes it a little easier to write the solution once you think of that transformation because I didn't have to specify how to solve it. I just needed to declaratively represent my problem in some way. And that makes the code a lot shorter. As a point of comparison, I sat down and wrote just kind of a straightforward closure backtracking algorithm to solve it using closures built in immutable data structures. And it was about 40 lines of code, which is pretty impressive. I mean, that's a, that's a testament to how concise you can get with closure. But the dancing links implementation you saw is two lines. Once you have the Y placements defined, it's just that matrix is just a zip map, and then you call dancing links. But we also see a huge performance difference here. You can see it especially when you get to the 15 by 15 grid. Uh, when you look at the find all of the solutions, on my computer, the dancing links algorithm took about 10 minutes. For the closure backtracking strategy, I let it run overnight on my computer, ran it for about 24 hours. It still wasn't done. I don't know how long it would have taken. I gave up at that point. So that brings us to the end of declarative model number one of three that I'll be showing you today called the exact cover problem. And it works on any problem whose constraints can be expressed as exactly one of. And for such problems, dancing links is generally going to be the fastest way to go. Another puzzle you might think of when you think of exactly one constraints would be Sudoku, right? Sudoku is all about exactly one constraints. You can use a very similar technique to this to turn a Sudoku grid into a matrix of ones and zeros that maps to this kind of solver. You pump it through the solver, you're going to get one of the most blazingly fast Sudoku solvers around. OK, moving on to our next model, which is the Boolean satisfiability problem. Now, the Boolean satisfiability problem is an NP-complete problem. And the idea is you're given an arbitrary Boolean formula. Oops, drop my water there. You're given an arbitrary Boolean formula, and you're trying to find a set of truth values for the variables that make this formula evaluate to true. So I've given here a sample formula using keywords as my variables, and I'm trying to find some kind of true-false values to associate with each of these variables to make this expression evaluate to true. Now, because it's NP-complete, worst case scenario, this is exponential time to solve a problem like this. But it turns out that many real-world instances of the Boolean satisfiability problem have a lot of structure to them that you can exploit with clever heuristics to find a solution much faster than the worst case. So this is something researchers have been working hard at for many decades, coming up with clever and clever ways to make solvers. And uh, there, there are many state-of-the-art amazing solvers out there. I wanted to build something like this in Clojure, but I didn't want to have to duplicate all that effort, which gave me another big insight. If Java is Clojure's assembly language, to me that means that there's 9 million developers out there who want to write my assembly code for me, just to make my programs faster. That makes me very happy. So I started to think of Java programmers as this great resource for me to use. And of course, what I'm talking about here is that Clojure has great interrupt with Java, we should be taking advantage of that. So I'd like to introduce another open source library I created called Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones is a closure library built on top of SAT4J, which is a Java SAT solver. 
and it supports three different problem input formats. And that's a really big deal because the underlying solver, SAT4J, only supports this one very specific kind of format called the integer conjunctive normal form, and that's not always the most convenient way to work with a logical formula. Uh, in fact, in this problem, this particular symbolic formula is already in conjunctive normal form, so it's a pretty straightforward transformation. But Rolling Stones can actually handle arbitrarily complex formulas. If it needs to, it will create temporary variables for each of the sub-expressions before it passes it into the solver. And then when it gets it back, it filters out all those temporary variables. So it comes back to you. It's a completely seamless process. You didn't have to worry about any of this stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Now, how do SAT solvers like SAT4J work? Well, I'm not going to go into that in this talk because this was already discussed at the last closure conj in the talk, A Peek Inside SAT Solvers. So check that out, and there's some other resources as well if you want to learn more about how SAT solvers work. For now, I'd like to focus on how you actually use Rolling Stones to solve problems effectively. Rolling Stones ex uh, exposes a bunch of constructors for building up formulas. Here I'm using and or not, an exclamation point is an alias for not. There's other things as well, like if and only if, XOR, and those are available. And you can build up your formula. Rolling Stones actually lets you use any data structure at all to be your variable. It doesn't have to be keywords, but in this example, I've used keywords. And then it spits out a list of the truth values of these things by giving you the variables that are true and the ones that, need to be, that are false to make this thing true, it has them wrapped in the not constructor. There's also a function called solution symbolic formula, which generates a lazy sequence of all the possible solutions. Now, if we're going to try to apply this to something like the Y cover problem, we already saw that that is mostly about exactly one constraints. So we need to know how to transform something like that into a logical formula. Well, it turns out there's always a way to do that. Here's an example of how you can do that with these four variables. Give me, you know, I want to make the statement exactly one of these four variables is true. So this formula accomplishes that. The first line is basically saying at least one of these variables is true. And the next six together are saying at most one of these variables is true. And the way it's accomplishing that is by saying pick any two variables, at least one of those has to be false. Now, this is such a common thing that you want to do with these sorts of SAT solvers that SAT4J actually has a much more efficient implementation of these sorts of constraints than manually expanding it to this kind of formula. It sort of handles it as a meta constraint that it's watching while doing the regular solving process. So I've exposed that in the Rolling Stones library with this kind of API here. Once we've done that, we have everything we need to be able to solve the Y cover problem with the Rolling Stones library. I mentioned before that any data structure can be our variable. So what I've done here is made a choice that each one of these placements, each set, is going to be a single variable. It's going to uh, represent whether this placement is actually in the grid or not. So if a variable, if one of these sets is needs to be true, that means it should be in the grid. If it's false, that means leave it out of the grid. Now we're going to go through each cell, and we're going to build these exactly one constraints. So for the 0, 0 cell, just as an example, in the upper left-hand corner, these are the only four Y placements that can cover that 0, 0 cell. And we know that exactly one of those placements must be in our grid. In other words, exactly four of these variables must be true. We can create a closure function, of course, to generate all those constraints for us. And then we simply pass it into solve symbolic formula, and we'll get back the result, another way of solving the Y cover problem. Let's take a look at the timing test to see how we've done here. You can actually see, looking at the 15 by 15 results, that going from if you're looking for just one solution, Rolling Stones actually beat Dancing Links in this particular case, which is a testament to how good these heuristics are built into SAT solvers for quickly zoning in on the combination of true variables. 
But when you try to find all of the solutions, it's a different story. Dancing Lynx clearly outperforms Rolling Stones. When you're, when you're making choices and then backtracking over and over and over again, it's really hard to beat that mutable, circular, doubly linked list data structure that Knuth came up with. But most importantly, why would we bother with Rolling Stones? The reason is because it allows us to solve a wider range of problems. For this problem, I wanted to put Ys on a 14 by 14 board. But a 14 by 14 board has 196 spaces. That's not a multiple of five. So if I want to do this, I'm going to have to relax the problem description and allow, some, allow four overlappings. So I set up the code to allow these four specific overlappings at 0, 0, 0, 3, 3, 0, and 3, 3. The space is marked in red here. And I was able to compute how many solutions there are that satisfy this. The way I did that is very simple with Rolling Stones. All I had to do was change for the cells that I want to allow to be my overlapping cells. I make those exactly two constraints instead of exactly one constraint. That's not something you could do with Dancing Links because Dancing Links can only handle exactly one. Another thing Dancing Links can't really do well is it can't relate one part of the board to the other. I wanted to find a rotationally symmetric solution to the Y covering problem. And that was pretty straightforward to do. What I did is, in addition to those exact one constraints, I added some logical constraints that a place, first I wrote this rotate piece function, which given a placement, it gives the 180 degree rotation around the board of that piece. And then I created these extra constraints that say, a placement holds if and only if its rotated piece 180 degrees around the board also holds. And then I decided to go crazy. I wanted to see if I could generate a cover where exactly 10 of the 20 pieces had reflective symmetry across the vertical axis. So how do you do something like that? Well, I wrote the function that lets you, given a piece, generate the placement uh, reflected across the vertical axis. And then I created this extra constraint that said exactly 10 of these formulas are true, where the formulas are saying that a placement and its reflection in the vertical axis are both true. So going back and looking at this picture, you can see these two pieces are mirror images, these two are mirror images, these two, these two, and these two, so that's 10 pieces total. The others do not match up across the vertical axis, so it found a covering with exactly 10 of the 20 mirroring across like this. That brings us to the end of declarative model number two, Boolean satisfiability. This model is really great for working with variables that can take on two values, true or false, it's really great when you have constraints that can be expressed either as a logic formula or exactly n of, at least n of, or at most uh, n of. And we saw from the timing tests that the heuristic approach really is good at rapidly finding one solution, but if you want to find all solutions, you should use dancing links, assuming your problem can actually be solved with dancing links. At this point, I'd like to take a brief interlude and answer a question that I sometimes get, which is, what do I personally use these libraries for? Well, my main line of work is that I am a game designer and a puzzle inventor. And my latest project is I've been developing a line of three puzzle logic games for kids, all based on computer science principles. And the reason I bring this up at this point in the talk is because this third game, Robot Repair, is actually the reason why I developed the Rolling Stones library. Robot Repair is modeled directly on the Boolean satisfiability problem. I, I literally took Boolean satisfiability problems and turned them into logic puzzles for kids. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for me to give a little plug for it, I guess. So uh, give the gift of Boolean satisfiability <laughs> to somebody you love to show them you care. Coming in August 2017 to Target stores everywhere, created with closure. Okay, moving on to our next model. 
Uh, our third and final model is constraint programming. Constraint programming is another declarative problem solving tool that deals with variables that can take on a finite number of integer values. Constraint programming solvers usually come with a wide assortment of different kinds of constraints as part of the library. It can handle logical constraints, arithmetic constraints, and there's usually a whole bunch of special purpose global constraints put in there too. And these create a really rich domain for expressing a wide variety of problems declaratively. Another interesting thing you can do with constraint programming solvers is you can do certain kinds of optimization by maximizing or minimizing certain variables. Loco is a library in Clojure written by Alex Engelberg. It sits on top of Choco, a Java constraint solver. And it has a very similar structure to the other two libraries I showed you in the sense that it uses the power of Clojure to let you make these data structures that represent your problem model. And then you pass it in the solver, and it does a lot of work behind the scenes, creating temporary variables, doing a lot of things that you don't want to have to worry about. Passes it in the solver, takes the results, passes it back to you in a way that is consumable for you in closure. These are some examples of the constraints that are built into Loco. Uh, you'll notice they all start with a dollar sign. It's not a jQuery thing. It's just a convention used in Loco to make the constraints really visually stand out from the other kind of functions. You may be wondering how constraint programming solvers work, but that is also outside the scope of this talk because Alex Engelberg explained that in the talk we gave together at ClojureCon 2015 called Solving Problems with Automata. In the second half of the talk, he spoke a little bit about how propagation strategies work and things like that. So check that out if you want to know more about the underlying mechanisms. I'm going to talk specifically about how you use something like Loco to solve our running example of the Y cover problem. The key thing is to realize that Loco can do anything that a SAT solver can do. Anything that you were representing before as a Boolean just becomes an integer variable in Loco that takes on the value of either zero or one. And a lot of the constraints that we had about the true how many true variables we have can just be expressed as arithmetic constraints. So if we want to say that exactly one of these variables are true, we're just saying that these four values, which are going to be either 0 or 1, need to add up to exactly 1. In loco, variables need to either be keywords or vectors starting with a keyword. They don't let you, it doesn't let you use any arbitrary data structure like I did in Rolling Stones. So we need to, we, we want to have a variable for every one of these placements, but we need to give it a name that matches, that's either a keyword or a vector starting with a keyword. So the easiest way to do that is to make every variable a vector that starts with a keyword choose, and then the second part of the vector is the specific placement. Conceptually, you can kind of think about it like in math, we use subscripted variables. So in math, these would all be, even though they all have the word choose, these are all different variables because they all have a different subscript, the subscript being the specific Y placement under consideration. And the range we're declaring is we're saying these have to all be values between 0 and 1 inclusively, meaning they're all effectively Booleans. And here is the code that would generate all those variable declarations. And then we do the same kind of thing that we did with Rolling Stones to build those exactly one constraints. And they become these sorts of constraints that say these variables have to add up to exactly one. Again, this is the example where of the four placements that cover the zero, zero cell in the upper left corner. And this here is the code that would generate all those constraints. We put together the variable declarations with all those exactly one constraints, and that's our model. And then we pass that declarative model to Loco's solution function. And it the way it returns the results to you is it gives you a mapping from all your variables to either 0 or 1, 0 being false, 1 being true. So since this is 0, that means this placement is not in our grid. Since this is 1, this placement will be in our grid, and so on. Let's take a look at the timing tests. You can see here that. Loco is definitely slower than the other options. In fact, when we get to the 15 by 15 grid, uh, it just struggles with that. It's, it's really problematic on that size. 
So again, why would we use it? And the answer is because it can handle a wider range of problems than either of the other libraries we talked about. We've expanded the expressiveness and the set of problems we can do declaratively. So this was one, you, you may remember from math class something called the four color map theorem. It says that any map, you can color it with four colors in such a way that two regions that are touching aren't the same color. Well, what if we wanted to see if there's a Y cover that can be colored with exactly three colors? So here's how I set up that model. I created a new set of variables that are the keyword color subscripted by the placement, and these have to range between zero and two, zero being red, one being green, two being blue. Then I built a bunch of constraints. I, I, I wrote this predicate called touching that I haven't actually shown here, but it tests whether two placements are touching each other on the grid. So for every combination of placements that are touching, I'm gonna create this constraint that says, if both placements are in our grid, their colors have to be not equal. Add this in with the other constraints that define the Y covering problem and pass this to Loco and you get back the three color solution that I showed you before. I mentioned that with Loco you can do certain kinds of optimization. So this is an example that shows that you can maximize the number of upright Ys where I've defined upright Y to be this shape in the upper left hand corner. So I, it found this solution that has eight upright Y pieces, and that's the best you can do. And the way I did that was with this code. What this is basically saying, we, we use this maximize keyword when we call solution. What we're trying to maximize is we're maximizing the sum of all the placement variables that are placement variables of the upright Y as you move it from left to right across this grid. And I, I'm not showing this function here, but it's, this is all in the GitHub code. That brings us to the end of declarative model number three, constraint programming. Constraint programming is great for variables with finite number of integer values. And it has many kinds of constraints available, so you can represent a lot of different kinds of problems declaratively and use this kind of solver. It supports optimization, but we found that it's from the timing test that it's generally slower than these other more specialized solvers if those apply. Well, this brings us to the end of the talk. I've shown three different ways to solve problems declaratively in Clojure. First, we looked at the library Tarantella, which used the dancing links algorithm to solve problems that can be expressed in terms of exactly one constraints. Rolling Stones used the SAT solver and added the capabilities of working with true-false variables and logical constraints. Loco added constraint programming, which gave us multi-valued variables, logical, and arithmetic constraints. Now, there's a few main ideas that I hope you come away from this talk with. First, there's a common pattern across these three libraries. All three of them are using the power of closure to let you conveniently manipulate data and describe your problem as a declarative model, and then the library handles the responsibility of handing that off to this speedy Java solving engine and then taking the results and interpreting those results back for you. And we saw that a lot of those libraries, the declarative layer that Clojure provides is definitely more expressive than what is provided from the underlying Java library. So we've definitely gotten added value from our interop. These three libraries actually can be used to solve very important classes of problems. SAT solver being, you know, it's one of the original NP-complete problems. So most NP-complete problems, the way they're proven NP-complete these days is by showing that a transformation exists to SAT problems. So a lot of really hard, challenging problems, it's already known how to transform those into something a SAT solver can do. Uh, even if these three libraries are not things that you necessarily have a problem that this fits with right away, I hope you will be inspired by these patterns and the techniques that I've shown here to wrap your own speedy Java engine or perhaps harness someone else's. Thank you very much. <laughs>